Serena Williams is widely regarded as one of the greatest tennis players of all time. She was ranked number one for 319 weeks. She's won 23 Grand Slam singles titles, four Olympic gold medals. You get the idea. She's really, really good. Her sister Venus is also extremely well accomplished, having won seven Grand Slam singles titles, amongst many other accolades. Now, in 1998, when Venus and Serena were ranked fifth, and 20th respectively, they famously claimed they could beat any man ranked outside the top 200. A German player named Karstan Plasch, ranked 203rd at the time, accepted their challenge. In a piece he wrote for The Observer, Plasch claimed that his training regime for the match consisted of a leisurely round of golf in the morning followed by a couple of shandies in the afternoon. Despite his unorthodox training style, Plash beats Serena 6-1 and Venus 6-2. Men's tennis and women's tennis are completely almost two separate sports. So I'm like, if I were to play Andy Murray, I would lose 6-0, 6-0 in five to six minutes, maybe 10 minutes, because it's not, <laughs> no, it's, it's true. It's, it's true. Honestly, it's a completely, really. It's a completely different sport. The men are a lot faster, and me and um, they they get they serve harder, they hit harder. It's just a different game, and I love to play women's tennis, and I I only want to play girls. Now, I don't tell this story to suggest that women are innately bad at tennis or that day drinking is the secret to beating a world-class tennis player. Rather, I tell this story to highlight the potency of a hormone called testosterone. You see, the reason why the Williams sisters lost to Plash is the same reason why there are weight classes in combat sports. At some point, physicality overrules skill and the game is no longer fair. And if you want physicality, you want testosterone. It's testosterone that stimulates the growth of our skeletal muscles, making men stronger and faster. It's testosterone that stimulates bone growth during puberty and maintains bone mineral density, making men taller, broader, with longer stride lengths and longer levers. It's testosterone that stimulates the production of red blood cells, giving men a greater oxygen carrying capacity and therefore greater cardiovascular endurance. It's what deepens a man's voice. It's what puts the hairs on a man's chest. It's testosterone that causes man boobs. Wait. For those of you who are new here, my name is Ed. I'm a final year medical student in the UK with an interest in health and fitness. Before I do get into the video, I'd like to quickly preface by saying that this is not medical advice. I'm not even qualified. So this is just what I know and I hope it interests some of you and helps some of you out. Now, gynecomastia is a condition in which female breast tissue proliferates in a man and it is one of the telltale signs of anabolic steroid use. But how can it be that supraphysiological levels of a male hormone can cause a female characteristic? To understand why, it's first important to look at some physiology. Now, the breast consists of what are called mammary glands, which are what produce the breast milk surrounded by fat and connective tissue. There are multiple hormones that stimulate breast growth, including estrogen, progesterone, prolactin, and insulin-like growth factor. Testosterone, on the other hand, inhibits breast growth. Now, both men and women actually have mammary glands deep to the nipple. However, during puberty, because estrogen levels are higher in women and testosterone levels are lower in women, this explains why their breasts develop, whereas the opposite is true in men and hence they don't develop. Hi guys, I'm just editing this video now and I realize I forgot to mention it is also the female sex hormone profile that stimulates fat deposition in the breasts themselves, uh, as well as in the kind of buttocks, thigh and hip area. It's what gives women the hourglass or gynoid fat distribution as it's officially called. So. Another important piece of information, back to the video. Gynecomastia is caused by an imbalanced estrogen to androgen ratio in men. In other words, it's due to too much estrogen or too little androgens or both. Gynecomastia commonly occurs in boys going through puberty who have a delayed surge in testosterone relative to their estrogen surge. The prevalence of gynecomastia also increases in men over 50 as endogenous androgen production naturally starts to decrease. But this still doesn't explain why taking testosterone stimulates gyno 
and that's because there's one more piece to the puzzle. Testosterone is converted to estrogen by an enzyme called aromatase. Therefore, when you inject testosterone, although you have an initial peak in androgens, your androgen concentrations then start to decline, followed by a peak in estrogens. And it's at this point when your estrogen to androgen ratio is too high, resulting in gynecomastia development. Aromatase is present in many tissues, including adipose tissue, which for those of you who don't know, is fat. This may also explain why bodybuilders are prone to gyno, as in the off season, not only are they blasting super physiological levels of testosterone, but they also have a very high body fat percentage, resulting in a significant proportion of that testosterone getting aromatized to estrogen. Bodybuilders who take growth hormone are also at higher risk of gynecomastia since growth hormone stimulates the liver to produce IGF-1 and IGF-1 stimulates breast tissue development. So what steps can you take to minimize your risk of developing gynecomastia as a bodybuilder? Well, the first thing would be to stay relatively lean. So I would say under 20% body fat. The second step is in choosing the steroid that you use. Some steroids have a higher propensity for aromatization than other steroids. Steroids that have a higher affinity for aromatase are called wet steroids and those with a lower affinity are called dry steroids. A few examples of dry steroids are Anavar and Winstrol. The third step is to use a lower dose of steroids and pin more often. This prevents large spikes in your hormones that can otherwise cause gynecomastia. So it would be better to pin a micro dose three to four times per week rather than a bolus once a week. So what are the management options for those with gyno and are trying to treat it? The first line management is using what's called a SERM that stands for Selective Estrogen Receptor Modulator. A few examples include uh, tamoxifen, clomiphene, uh, raloxifene, SERMs act by blocking the estrogen receptor at the breast, which therefore prevents estrogen from binding and stimulating growth. Serms are preferred because they are selective, so they block the estrogen receptor in some areas, namely the breast, but not others. And this is important because we actually do need some level of circulating estrogens, even as men. Estrogens have many important functions there vasculoprotective, they're neuroprotective, they, we, need the, we need estrogen for libido. So you don't want to just completely inhibit estrogen altogether. So that's, this is why serums are preferred because they're selective and they have less side effects. The second line option are aromatase inhibitors. A few examples are anastrozole and letrozole. These obviously work by inhibiting aromatase, therefore blocking the conversion of testosterone to estrogen which lowers your just circulating estrogen levels overall. If the pharmacological options don't work, the last line is obviously surgery in which you just get the gland removed entirely altogether. That's pretty much it, guys. Uh, thank you for watching the video. Um, hopefully you enjoyed this kind of new format. Any feedback in the comments would be really appreciated. I'll try and implement anything that you guys suggest.